after the first round table we had concerning uh, consensus and not necessarily very optimistic conclusion. <laughs> Everyone agrees we need consensus, but there is a big work to, to get done yet. And we are now getting out to our second round table. Second round table dedicated to, uh, well, certainly one of the most important long-term reform we need and one of the most important topics, which is education and talent. Uh, how good education is implemented, uh, talent attraction, talent retention, very, very important topics you all know in uh, your countries and in your economies. So education and talent, to talk about it in the second round table, we've got three panelists, and I let you take your seat before presenting them. Three panelists with us today to talk about education. Uh, first of all, Mr. Simon Pei, Director of the Independent Commission Against Corruption from Hong Kong. Alexander Stubb, Vice President of the European Investment Bank and former Prime Minister of Finland. And uh, I was about to say last but not least, Mauro de Nambrogio. If I mention that, it's because I've been working with Mauro de Nambrogio during seven or eight years as a member of parliament. He was the former State Secretary of Education um, and uh, Innovation, uh, Research and Innovation in Switzerland and Bern. And to lead this, uh, to lead this panel uh, with us today, Professor Taufik Jalassi. Uh, Taufik Jalassi is Professor of Strategy and Technology Management at IMD. And before joining, Joining IMD, we must mention this, Dr. Jalassi was Minister of Higher Education, Scientific Research and Information and Communication Technologies in the transition uh, to democracy government of Tunisia. Uh, Taufik, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fatih. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, thank you for coming back. Uh, so as it was mentioned, uh, I served also as a Minister of Education, Research and Technology. Uh, Christ, uh, yeah, it was Christmas Day 2013. I was on vacation in the US. I got a phone call from the new Prime Minister of Tunisia, who I did not know, offer me, offer, offering me that position after having spent 35 years outside of Tunisia. Come back, help us. We are in post Arab Spring Revolution Tunisia. I want you to lead three ministries in that context. But be warned of the difficulties and the challenges. But once you say yes, you cannot complain and you cannot resign. <laughs> that was the offer. I was dean of a business school at the time. So anyway, I jumped into the cold water, tried to swim, not to sink. I'm very happy to welcome our panelists who uh, will share with us their respective experiences in certainly three excellent benchmarks in the world about education and talent. Uh, we all agree, I think, that any country's long-term prosperity depends to a large extent on the quality of its education and its ability to acquire retain talent in order to perform well and to develop its economy and its social system. So we are going to start with our first speaker, seated to my left, Mauro de Lambrogio, who served for 11 years as State Secretary for Education, Research, and Innovation in Switzerland, a post that he held until 2018. So the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Good afternoon. I'm trying to present the Swiss education system in five minutes. Uh, it's not a unique system. It's more a radical form of what you find as well in Germany and Austria. The main system that uh, was not completely reformed like in other European countries, but uh, keep certain element of traditional system, uh, like in the Middle Age, in which the, 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 the guilds, the, the organization of, of the business, are in charge of education and didn't delegate this to the state like it happened after, especially after the French Revolution. Uh, in Switzerland, 70%, 70, at the age of 15, stop the full-time school and start to work. Uh, they continue to have school, but it was one day per week, but they, they try to learn by doing in the real world. 
And that is what say the, the real particularity of the system, that learning by doing in the real world is not a plan B in comparison by studying in school at full time. But it's an equal equivalent. We have this in the constitution, the two systems, the vocational training system and the full time school system are equivalent. And in principle, they open all careers. In Switzerland, you can become Minister of Finance or CEO of the main bank uh, without a degree. Uh, accumulating experience on the field and uh, upgrading what you learned. Uh, our idea is that you, you can start as an electrician and then becoming an electric engineer and then uh, a PhD in uh, electronics. Uh, this is the same values or the parts to having full-time studying to the same goal. This system allows especially permeability and uh, it's an answer to the, to the challenge that we have today in Europe that where the most countries try to bring everyone to university, but you have uh, students that are bored, not motivated, they drop out and they become unskilled worker and they become unemployed. Uh, we, the idea is that it's better to work than to bore in school. The, this system allows as well to integrate better migrants. 50% of the students in Swiss schools have at least one of the parents not born in Switzerland. And it's absolutely normal for reason of, of cultural background, language and family, that the access to the, to the senior high school uh, is, is very discriminating. That means in general, my, uh, children of migrants have by far less chances to have full-time studies. But after in the, in the career, in the, in the, in the job market, uh, we have uh, by far a higher social mobility than countries that try to bring everyone to studying and to university. This system is not easy to imitate. I, in the, my 11 years, I had hundreds of uh, invitations in different countries to try to explain the system. But the system works for two important reasons. First of all is that companies know that they can have good apprentices because with 70% you have as well talent people. If you bring 60, 70% of the people to full-time school and for the rest you offer an apprenticeship, companies know that there's, there's dropout from school and they are not interested to engage these people. Quantity make, makes quality. And the second reason is prestige. Families should be proud to have children that make an apprenticeship. Uh, I am my, myself an example. I have seven children, two of them adopted, and the large majority of them made an apprenticeship. And the two with the higher salary today went through the apprenticeship. If, if, if I spoke in general to, to, to colleagues in another European country that wanted to introduce to improve the system, my question was always, is your middle class, is your bourgeoisie ready to accept to send their children to an apprenticeship? And, and in general, this is not feasible. And for this reason, this is not the system that you can to simply copy. And uh, last, a last remark, um, this system as well allows to create a mentality that if you want talent, talent should be real talent. It is better to import talent from abroad, uh, how Switzerland in general does, than to try to, to push your young people to become talented if they are not. They can become good professionals, but I will say the very the most selective careers in general uh, in spite of the fact that people have a degree or not, are based on, on a global competition. And uh, you have in Switzerland more than 50% of all university professors are not Swiss. And it's normal for, for, for the Swiss understanding of, of, of the fact that certain careers are for, for talent. And the fact as well that a majority of the entrepreneurs in the Switzerland, especially in Swiss history, all big Swiss companies were founded by, by, by migrants. And uh, we try to build up on this tradition that we offer equivalent paths of education for the uh, young people here, and we expose them to a global competition. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation on the specificities of the Swiss education system and talent development.
To what extent does the local approach versus the federal centralized approach, which is key in Switzerland, to what extent does that contribute to the education excellence that we see? There's absolutely a bottom-up bottom system. 70% is an average. But we have a region in Switzerland, a very successful region, in which 85% of the young people made an apprenticeship. And uh, in Geneva, for example, you have at 50% no more because of the influence of France and so on. But it's absolutely normal. There's not a steering of the system, a central steering. And the same in school. I can make a good, a, a small example. Uh, you know the, the, PISA, uh, the PISA test that mm -hmm. says you how much. Uh, is we have cantons in Switzerland in which uh, children until the age of 15 have the double, the double, two times how in school than in other cantons. But the result in PISA is more the same. So that means they are not a causality between a certain organization of kind of education to reach a certain result. Uh, the education system should be, in a certain, certain way, uh, lived and, and, and integrated by the local culture of families, of, of companies. And uh, we, have, we never had the illusion to have a federal education system. Uh, the, the system is Swiss, but the system is very differentiated and bottom-up. Thank you. I think this is another major difference between the Swiss system, which is bottom up, as you put it, versus most countries I'm aware of, where, where it is centralized. And the Minister of Education decides on curricula or training or graduation requirements or the like. Thank you, Mauro. Let's proceed with our second uh, speaker in this uh, round table, Alexander Stubb, currently Vice President of the European Investment Bank, based in Luxembourg. Uh, he was uh, the Prime Minister of Finland, but he also held other top government positions in Finland. He was Minister of Finance, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Trade and Europe. Uh, and, uh, and also he uh, used to be uh, the chairman of the National Coalition Party in Finland. Thank you, Alex, for being with us this afternoon. Thanks, thanks, uh, Tafik. In, uh, in my allotted five minutes, you know, I'm a Finn, and we Finns are very shy. We don't speak much. So five minutes is an extremely long time. <laughs> uh, and and, and I, I don't know if you saw the press conference yesterday with the President Donald Trump and the President of Finland. Um, it was nice for our president. He didn't have to say much. <laughs> um, but but, but uh, he, he, he did say one thing, and he said that uh, you have a great democracy. Keep it going. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you know, sometimes less is more, if, if, if you will. Um, I, 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 I will try to make three points today, but by, by way of introduction, uh, I guess I have to give a claim to fame. And, you know, why am I sitting here speaking about education as a Finn? And I would probably argue that there are three reasons. One is that I've gone through the education system from 0 to 18, 19 in Finland. All of my university education is then abroad, but I did that in Finland, the basic stuff. Two, uh, I have two children who are now 18 and 15 who have both gone through or are in the process of going through that system. And then number three, um, Mauro mentioned the PISA studies, of course, Finland has had the privilege to be ranked one, two, or three, basically, ever since those studies started. So something must be right with the Finnish uh, educational system. And that's probably why I've been asked to, to, to say a couple of words. And I'll, I'll say three things. Number one is on the principles of education. Number two is on why we have great teachers. And number three is why we have motivated students. Now, and then finally, I'll give five basically recommendations. So number one, you know, what are the principles? Well, they're quite simple and they are in the constitution. It basically says that everyone has the right to education. It basically says that that education has to be free of charge. And it also says that everyone has to have equal opportunity. And that's the starting basis. So there is no differentiation between any individual in Finland when they start uh, at school. And I think that's extremely important. Uh, other principles that I would sort of pick out of the system is that the system is comprehensive. So there are no real dead ends. That you know, if you fall out at some stage, you go through your nine years, 
we'll try to find something for people to do. At the end of the day, we actually have 84% of the population with some kind of a university or secondary uh, degree. So we're moving in the, in the right direction. Uh, also, one of the principles is inclusiveness, and I'll come back to that in a, in a second. It tries to cater to all. So if you are uh, you know, a little bit better in class, they'll try to cater to you. Or if in school you were average like I was, uh, then they try to help you out as well. And if you are poor, uh, not doing well, they try to help. So it's inclusive in many ways. Uh, and therefore, I think one of the key principles is that the learning gaps that we have are quite small uh, in the system. And you can see that quite well in the IMD study uh, and the paper, which I, I strongly recommend that was presented for this panel. Now, my second point, the question is, wh why are Finnish teachers good? And I, I say this from the bottom of my heart. I mean, I still have heroes that I, I look up, up to uh, who were my teachers. Uh, I would pick the following reasons. Number one uh, is an element of respect and trust. Being a teacher is extremely respected in Finland. People like it. Uh, it it's one of the top jobs you know, with doctors, nurses, uh, etc. Number two, you need a master's degree to teach. And this is quite rare in the world. And only 10% of the people who apply get into the master's education system. So you have your special line that you teach, but you basically become, have a master of education, of, of pedag pedagogical things. And I, I think that's very important. Uh, number three, and this is very important, teaching autonomy. We, I wouldn't call it a top-down nor a bottom-up system. There is a general curricula, but then it's up to the teacher to decide how he or she uh, teaches that. Uh, I have visited, since 2004, 150 schools, giving talks on different types of issues. So I've been to a lot of teachers' rooms and a, and a lot of classrooms. And every time you go there, you get the feeling that, yeah, you know, these guys have the autonomy to teach. I'll give you one example. I went to a fourth grade school. Uh, they were trying a new system. There were no regular uh, school desks or chairs. There were sofas, a few tables, lazy boys. There was no teacher who was teaching that day a particular subject. But every student in fourth grade had a pad uh, iPad of sorts, where they had tasks to do for the whole week. And then the teacher would walk around and help those students do it. And they would do it at their own pace. I, I think that's out of the box. It, teaching the curriculum, but in an autonomous uh, fashion. And then, of course, you know, one of the things is that I think the salaries, we can always discuss, are at least fairly uh, good for Finnish teachers. Um, as now a father, um, I would like to say they need to be higher. As finance minister, I, I wouldn't have agreed with my, uh, you, you know how these things go. Um, then thirdly and finally, my, my point is, is that we have, I would argue, fairly motivated students. I, I'm not saying I was one because I, I, I was more of the, you know, at school, especially after the age of 15, I was interested in three things and they were, you know, sports, beer, and girls, kind of, you know the type, right? Uh, and, 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 and so don't put me in that box, but when I look at the kids that I see nowadays, they're motivated. Why? Uh, one of the reasons is there's no standardized testing. You know, I've done my SATs and GREs and the rest of it, but there's none of that in Finland. Of course, there is a matriculation when you come out, you know, you do the tests, but, but there's no sort of tick in the box. Uh, second, Finnish school kids spend less time in class than, 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 than their equivalents around the world, which I think is a, is a good thing. Some people are scared, you know, what, are your kids home already at one o'clock or two o'clock from, from school? Yeah, <laughs> they are. They also have less homework, although I must admit that I'm quite proud of my kids because they do a lot of homework. I don't remember doing any homework at all when I was in school, but that was more my problem than, than, than theirs. But th there's, there's not that element of this has to be extremely competitive. You have to you know, perform. You have to get everything right. Uh, and I, I think the notion of curiosity and learning and, and just being a kid Allowing a child to be a child uh, is an important element. Um, 
average class size in Finland uh, is approximately 20. I know in your papers it looked a little bit better. Thank you. But <laughs> it is around 20. Uh, on top of that, I think there are two elements which are quite important. One is that there's free food at school. Uh, it's not Michelin star kind of stuff, but <laughs> you know, it's there. Uh, and, and that was also, I, I think, again, when you look at an egalitarian system. And then finally, uh, the classes are 45 minutes and the breaks are 15 minutes. So after every 45 minutes, there's 15 minutes to get oxygen outside, no matter what the weather. So my conclusion is, and I'm, I'm not saying that it works everywhere, but my conclusion is that the Finnish system is good for five reasons. Number one, equal opportunity for everyone. Number two, freedom for the kids and autonomy for the teachers to teach. Number three, respect and trust in the teachers. Number four, focus on learning, not steering and forcing information upon a child. Let the child figure things out, him or herself. And then number five, you need to have a good infrastructure which basically means that the schools need to be in shape, the, the, the material needs to be there in order for you to have good quality education. Having said all of this, if and when someone was listening to me in Finland right now, you will understand that these are all extremely good goals to have. But nothing in an educational system is perfect. But in a good system, you at least have some of these elements present. So here are my three points. Number one, key principles. Number two, great teachers. Number three, motivated students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, over lunch, we had a bit of a discussion and then stood, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the Finnish Teachers Union played a certain role in the history maybe pushing in a certain way towards a quality education in the country. Something that picked my attention. Can you say a word yeah, about de it? De definitely. First of all, there was a big educational reform in the 60s and 70s where the principles that I outlined uh, were found then in the constitution and a new system of, of first and secondary school was made. And there, I think the unions were very strong in pushing that and some parties, by the way, excluding my party at the time, which I think uh, was a mistake. Um, uh, but then the teachers have a very strong say in the way in which things are run. Um, there is a central education board uh, which is closely involved with the teachers union and setting up the curriculum and, and, curriculum and working together. So in that sense it's, it's very much a, I mean, there was talk earlier about uh, uh, cohesiveness and, 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 and compromise and and coalitions and, and coming together, they try to do that. But as in any system, there's always you know, tough debate about what should be done and what should not be done, whether it's about you know, should we teach history or, or should uh, Swedish, our second language, be a mandatory language and so on and so forth. But yeah, the teachers' unions have been very strong and, 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 and good at pushing the government, nudging the government in the right direction. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's proceed with our third speaker, Mr. Simon Pei, uh, who, who is currently the independent uh, commissioner at the Independent Commission Against Corruption in Hong Kong's Special Administrative Region in China. He was appointed to this position by the central government of the People's Republic of China in July 2012. Before that, he used to be director of immigration for many years. Please, Mr. Pa, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, um, Professor. Uh, so, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm going to share is a bit different from the other two speakers because I will share our experience in ethics or integrity training education in Hong Kong uh, over the last uh, 40, 45 years. Uh, but before I talk about that, I, I, I should introduce Hong Kong because Hong Kong, maybe you are not so familiar. And Hong Kong is ranked the 18th among 63 economies and the first in the Eastern Asia region in the IMD World Talent Ranking 2018. Uh, this uh, talent ranking report uh, drawing reference from the Rule of Law Index of the World Justice Project finds a strong positive correlation between the institutional strengths, namely 
a robust rule of law and low level of corruption, and a high talent ranking of an economy. So the cross-referencing is uh, 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 of this information with the global national income data. Uh, for example, those compiled by the IMF, uh, we can also observe that the top performers in the talent report also enjoy higher GDP per capita. Hong Kong's experience surely supports this uh, correlation. So I'm going to show you a, a, a table uh, you can see on the screen, which shows that among the 20 top performers in the talent ranking, 16 of them are among the top 20 in the rule of law index and also the Transparency International's Corruption Pre Perception Index. These economies are also on the high end of GDP per capita ranking. In respect of Hong Kong, we are the 18th in the IMD Talent Index, 14th in the Corruption Perception Index, 16th in the Rule of Law Index, and 17th in the GDP per capita ranking. So from our point of view, these are hard-earned results made possible by our institutional strengths, including an effective anti-corruption system. And uh, when we go back to history, Hong Kong was uh, very bad in corruption, very backward, uh, small city, uh, with its uh, economic activities mainly focused on entry port, trade and manufacturing in the 1970s. That is before the establishment of um, my commission, the Independent Commission Against Corruption. And the economy of Hong Kong has undergone a rapid growth since then, showing, we call it a virtuous cycle of effective elimination of corruption, strengthening of uh, rule of law, and a quantum leap in social and economic developments. Now Hong Kong has become one of the cleanest economies with some of the strongest institutions in the world. So uh, the Heritage Foundation has ranked Hong Kong the freest economy for the past 25 years. So uh, Hong Kong is, uh, is now a global leading financial investment services and logistic hub. This is despite the fact that Hong Kong is a very tiny dot on the world map with only 1,100 square kilometers in size. And without any natural resources, uh, we have a high population density. What we can rely on to drive its growth is our strong institutions and the ingenuity of people, or in other words, talent. And the Hong Kong story demonstrated that in addition to professional competence, education level, technical know-how, and the readiness to embrace change, our city also values talent which, uh, who possess a high level of ethical standard and uphold the rule of law at all times. So in the Chinese culture, as in some other culture, integrity is considered more important than professional skills and intelligence. So it goes without saying that a person with high competence but low ethical standard will only do more harm than good to the society. So against the background of a rampant corruption in the 1970s, which I mentioned earlier, uh, our commission has been steadfast in promoting ethics and integrity to Hong Kong people. And our integrity is ingrained in our culture and is embraced by Hong Kong citizens as a core value of our society. Many have considered this as a miracle, but in fact, our strategies and uh, interrupt, uninterrupted efforts on a permanent basis in public education and civic engagement are the critical success factors in making these changes possible. Uh, since the establishment of our commission 45 years ago, we have been acutely aware of the importance of intensive value education to nurture ethical values among our population. We deploy a proactive and target-oriented, we call it ethics for all approach, to reach out to every corner of our society, starting from toddlers in kindergarten to university students who will lead our society into the future, and also reaching out to members of the public, private, and civic sectors. So by dividing our target groups into these different segments, we will be able to customize our public education and engagement programs so as to foster stronger resistance to corruption and entrench an integrity culture in the society. 
in tandem with our education and engagement programs tailored for different social groups, we also make good use of the mass and social media to maximize the publicity uh, impact across the whole territory. I'm going to show, show you a short video which will highlight the breadth and depth of our educational and engagement work carried out by our community relations department. So please watch the video. Corruption prevention work wouldn't be a success without the correct perception and ethical values among the public. Our community relations department furthers our cause effectively through publicity and education in different sectors. On corruption prevention education, the CRD organizes corruption prevention seminars for government departments while promoting a clean civil service culture. Collaborations with business, professional organizations and industries to advocate business ethics and honest management, tailor-made corruption prevention kits for specific industries, establishing corruption prevention networks to share related experience. CRD jointly holds regular talks and seminars, tea gatherings, exhibitions, competitions, performances, etc. through our regional offices with district organizations. By improving the public's awareness on anti-graft laws and work, cultivating a probity society, and enlisting the public's support from different strata of society. On publicity and education, the CRD uses extensive mass media through TV drama productions, radio dramas, TVCs, internet and new media, as well as newspaper articles to promote ICAC's work and educates the public regarding the evils of corruption. We regularly release through the mass media information on issues of public concern and gauge community feedback to enhance the Commission's transparency. The younger generation will carry the anti-corruption mission forward. ICAC places particular emphasis on moral education for the youth and takes an active role in inculcating positive values in young people. Students are educated and encouraged through educational kits and the ICAC Ambassador Program, grooming future clean generations. After decades of hard work, the CRD has established a tightly knit network with the public. Hong Kong people have become ICAC's indispensable partner in fighting corruption and upholding Hong Kong as a clean and fair society. Okay, this uh, video showed that how we develop our local talent and workforce to make sure they will embrace high ethical standards, thereby help build a fair society, a clean government, a level playing field in the business sector, and a low level of corruption and strong rule of law. This will in turn attract more highly skilled professionals from the international talent pool. In, 19, in 2018, uh, we issued over 41,000 visas on employment or investment uh, to uh, foreigners and uh, more than 4,500 applicants were admitted under the quality migrant admission scheme, which aims at attracting highly skilled or talented persons to settle in Hong Kong. Uh, the figures may not make sense, but if you use the, the, the IMD World Talent Ranking 2018, Hong Kong is ranked the ninth among 63 economies in attracting foreign highly skilled professionals uh, in respect of individual countries' business environment. So the three-pronged strategy of, of our commission combining law enforcement, systematic prevention, and public education and engagement has proven to be profoundly effective in fighting corruption. In particular, through continuous public education and engagement, we're able to win the hearts and minds of our people and develop talent who have strong integrity disposition. With a society firmly anchored in ethical culture and strong rule of law, we will be able to live up to the vision pioneered by our founding commissioner who said 45 years ago that there can be no real victory in our fight against corruption unless there are changes of attitude throughout the community. Hong Kong has a number of strong institutional strengths and our anti-corruption system is one of them. But uh, some of you may notice that uh, recent social events and protests in Hong Kong, given our strategic role as a leading international financial center, what's happening in Hong Kong is no doubt of utmost interest to many people around the world. So it is therefore crucial to get hold of the facts comprehensively 
rather than some maybe bias or misleading information. There are some disruptions, but I can assure you that the fundamentals and institutional underpinning of our economy and social society remain strong. The one country, two system principle provides a constitutional guarantee for Hong Kong's continued development and success as a free and open society, an economy with strong rule of law and independent judiciary. So Hong Kong remains a safe, open, welcoming, and cosmopolitan society, and an internationally connected, vibrant, and dynamic economy. As a resourceful, reasonable, and resilient society, our people are our greatest strength and possess the wisdom and uh, wherewithal to overcome any challenges as in the past. Business and daily lives go on as usual in Hong Kong. Major events like the fourth Belt and Road Summit, which was held in the mid-September, with more than 5,000 participants from more than 60 countries are still running without incident or interruption. So Hong Kong is definitely still open for business and safe to travel. So I earnestly welcome you to visit or do business in Hong Kong. So maybe you have this kind of ad, which is uh, issued by the Hong Kong government. Uh, I think you may have one in your hand. So if you need, want to discuss with me to understand the latest situation in Hong Kong, so uh, you can do it, uh, welcome you to do it at the sideline in the next two days. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pei. I have a short question for you, if I may. Uh, you mentioned uh, that integrity is a core value in society, and I suppose that you do enhance the awareness about integrity in your educational system. Are there other specific measures that were taken in the education system to help fight corruption? Well, uh, integrity education is only part of the education. Mm -hmm. So I said, um, well, we have teachers who will um, compile the teaching material for use in the kindergartens, in the primary schools, let a teacher to use them. And um, we have um, interactive opera, where, uh, the program for uh, secondary students, and we have uh, ambassadors in the universities. And uh, this is different strategies. We do it on a, on a year and year basis to educate a new generation of young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So I propose that we sure. step in the Q&A now. Uh, if you have questions, we are now here on a central topic, I think, on competitiveness. Uh, it is, to a great extent, depends on education. We agree on this point. Uh, if there are questions, just raise your hand. I've got already one question here. Just one question to the former uh, finance minister. Uh, Prime Prime you, didn't minister. Talk, you didn't talk about public expenditures. What does it represent for you in Finland? Is there a big investment? What is it exactly? Well, I think any time you use public expenditure for education, it's an investment. Yeah. Uh, and the question is, at what level do you put it? Uh, I think one of the interesting things of the study uh, that you put forward is it was looking at um, money used per student uh, in what 64 different countries and there was not a direct correlation between input and outcome and the example that was obviously used was the US education mm -hmm. system where you spend up to 15, 16,000 US dollars per annum and the education system is not very strong, but there was a fairly happy medium between nine to ten thousand uh, dollars uh, where Finland lies as well, where you put in the student. But I think the key there is, I mean, we do have some private schools in Finland, but, but, but the bottom line is that they follow the same uh, sort of financial system. The key is that you don't create this kind of a huge discrepancy between a public school by definition, in other words, uh, state school versus a private school mm -hmm. that you in that way create a separation between the students the level of the school should be the same throughout it's never going to be perfect but uh, it is the difference is going to be smaller than for instance in the UK system first question uh, it was a lady yes madam thank you very much my name is La Fisher I work in finance um, I'm an alumnus of IMD I never have been in government, and I'm acutely aware of the challenges of 
obtaining, educating, and retaining talent. They're challenges that are national, but that are also real for every company. And one of the key things that we are thinking about in the firms I work with is what has gotten our educational system to where we are is not what will get our countries to where we need to go. Certain things need to change about education. The very concept of standardized curricula that change every five years, um, the very concept of um, time spent in the classroom for your first, uh, well, with the exception of Switzerland, for your first 20 years of life or 25 years. Perhaps all of these things need to change. Um, and I think this question is open to anyone on the panel. What are your countries doing about it? What do you think? How do politics see this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Who's first? Please. Change could be steered top down or it can happen because the system is not steered. For example, if you, like Switzerland, in general, the professional learning is not made by teachers but by professionals. The fact that, for example, nurses learn one or two days in school, but for the most part of the time they go to hospital to learn. The hospital develop uh, the, the, from the te technological point of view, at the other point of view, the professions of nurse develop, and in this way you develop the learning system as well. There is not someone in the ministry that say, now we, we teach nurses in another way. Uh, if you relate directly what you learn, I don't speak until the age of 14, 15. Perhaps you have only to learn from Finland uh, when you speak about teachers. But the, the, the difference started at the age of could be 14, 16, when you leave the, the normal basic school, the, the, the primary and secondary school, and you start to, to learn something that is useful directly for your career and for your, for your chances. I, I think there's a wonderful book uh, called The 100-Year Life. Uh, and, and one of the theses that I remember from it is that, you know, our lives, I, I look around the room here, uh, our generation, our life is basically based on three things. One is study, two is work, three is retire. <laughs> yeah. uh, when, I, when I talk to kids nowadays uh, around the world, their life long learning is going to be completely different. Their cycle is going to be Study, work, study, work, study, work, die. Uh, you know, so, so basically, you know, it, it's going to ha have to be completely different. And therefore, my advice to, to, you know, because I get asked quite often, you know, Alex, when you were young, you were into sports, but then you got into academia. You know, what, what, what should I study? I said, listen, it's not so much about what you're going to study, but I give three pieces of advice which are probably stolen from Yuval Harari or someone else. Uh, the first piece of advice is that you have to learn how to learn. So learn how to analyze. When I was a kid, I had to memorize stuff. Mm -hmm. Forget that. You don't need that anymore. Machines do it for you already, uh, and in the future, they will do it to an increasing effort. Second, learn emotional intelligence. Because when we move towards a world where the digital revolution becomes more and more predominant, artificial intelligence, robotization, and the rest of it, what we are left with is a sense of empathy, the way in which we treat each other. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, I, I, I tell a lot of these kids to learn how to take care of yourself, which basically means that you need to have a better connection between mind and body. That's going to be what sustains you in the professional life. And, and I think that takes us in the right direction. That's why I think your question is so good, because you know, uh, in a few years, we might as well start throwing out the five-year, the 10-year, or, or the 20-year the, the cycle of curricula, because it is going to be so much faster, and the whole concept of learning is going to be so much different from what we were used to. I, I fully agree that as a father of children of 18, 19, 20 years old, yeah. uh, learn to learn is something very important. But at some point in the beginning, mustn't they just know about the basics? Maths, physics, you yeah. know, if you want to understand the digital revolution, which I don't, yeah. <laughs> algorithms and those kind of things, isn't there some kind of basis you must learn in the beginning? Yeah. No, definitely. I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I think the basic concepts, as much as I hated maths yeah. and loved languages, you know, I always felt that both of them are, you know, integral part of who you are. So you need to learn the new things. But I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a child of the liberal arts education. I, I did my undergraduate in the United States, where basically, you know, at the age of 20, 
you're not forced to take a decision that I'm going to become an engineer, I'm going to become a doctor, I'm going to become a lawyer. You get a broad span of stuff. I went in uh, with a dream of becoming a golf professional and getting an economics degree. And I came out quitting golf immediately, understanding that I know little <laughs> about economics. Hello, banking. Uh, and, and number three, I'm a big fan of international relations and philosophy. So you know, give that sort of curiosity to, to, to the child but at the same time give the basis. Give you two examples. My daughter is 18. She's adamant on going to study medicine in the United Kingdom. And she will do that. Fine. The world of medicine with a combination of technology and biology is going to be completely different in 10 years from what it's now. But she'll learn about it. My son is 15. He doesn't know exactly what he wants to do. And I'm not worried one bit. He can, he can choose at a much later stage. We need kids who can adapt to stuff but have a good basis. Thank you. Mr. Pitt, did you want to bring something? No. no. Perhaps even for the basics, you're not to over-evaluate the role of school. I make a small example. I come from the Italian-speaking minority in Switzerland. And in general, we, we learn French, German, and, and everyone asks you well, should have a good DNA that allow you to learn more languages or a good school. Not at all. We are simply exposed socially to a need to use different languages, and that's make a, a, a pressure. And you learn for this reason. There's not to over-evaluate what you put in the in the school programs. Uh, you have not to forget that the social environment is uh, is, is at least uh, at the same the same importance. As well, for the point of equal opportunity, equal opportunity is the central point in a was a more homogeneous. A uh, country like Finland, it would be absolutely impossible in Switzerland. You cannot imagine that uh, 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 children of migrants could be the same chance in school, like school of well-off uh, Swiss families. They have a library at home and so on. You cannot compensate the school this difference. You can only compensate in the fact that you don't give the school the power to select career of people in a definitive way. Another question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Redel Andalusi from the company Waves Ventures. I'm involved in uh, projects related to education, entrepreneurship, and uh, innovation in emerging countries. And I wanted first to thank uh, Professor Gelassi for this uh, uh, panel. My question would be for uh, Mr. Stubb. Uh, there isn't one conversation in emerging countries where Finland is not uh, taken as an example for its education system. And I'd like to know, from your opinion, how much of your system can be exported? I know you touched a little bit on it during your speech, but wanted to, uh, to hear more about it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, in many ways, it's a sensitive question. First of all, I mean, I, I would be kidding you if I said I'm not miffed and proud of the fact that the Finnish education system is circulated as, as the number one model around the world. I think it's phenomenal. You know, I come from a small country which is in the northeastern margins of, of, of Europe with a fairly uh, harsh climate, and that has gone from you know, rugs to riches uh, in the span of, I'd say, 30 to 40 years because of openness, internationalism, but basically because of education. Now, we do actually have some Finnish schools um, that have been taken over. And I mean, I've seen, I visited in Saudi Arabia. Are we teaching exactly the same stuff in Saudi Arabia as we do in Finland? No, is the answer. Uh, can it be taken lock, stock, barrel? No, it cannot. But there are elements of it which, which can. Uh, and I think those elements were in the principles that I discussed earlier. In other words, equal opportunity. And by Mauro, I don't mean with equal opportunity that everyone gets the same stuff. It means that everyone has the same basis, and then you start catering to special needs if you possibly can. Culture is one thing that, you know, I, I come from a country where, you know, gay marriage, no problem. Uh, you know, equal rights. My government, more women than men. Uh, you know, when I was foreign minister, more female diplomats than male diplomats. You can't get it. Um, I, I love the IMD. In Finland, we would not have an all-male panel, huh? especially two in a row. Uh, so, so, you know, yeah. No, no. So, so, sorry, Arturo is going to fire me. I, that wasn't. Uh, no, but uh, so so can we take it like that? No, you cannot. But there are some elements that you can pick and choose. And for me, they would be the equal opportunity, 
the autonomy for the teachers to teach how they like, and then the freedom for the kids to, to flourish. You know, don't, don't whip them, just you know, let them do their stuff. But if I may just have a, maybe a naughty question or a Swiss question. Um, then it's probably tomorrow. No, 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 no. <laughs> I completely agree on no, the point that you cannot export an education system. Yeah. No, that's, that's certain. Too much element that, yeah. that must connect with, with families, uh, tradition, with uh, the environment, uh, with, uh, with uh, companies, but with uh, the job market and so on. You cannot export the system. We agree, but my chauvinistic question was this one. Uh, <laughs> we agree that Finnish uh, Scottish uh, school is really a model. PISA rankings always get you at the top of it. But when we look at universities, uh, then we see that the only European universities in the top 20 in Shanghai class uh, ranking are Swiss, <laughs> uh, which are the two Swiss Institutes of Technology. The United Kingdom is still a part of Europe. N yeah, kind of, kind of, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> uh, excluding United I, I, Kingdom. I say, this as an al I say this as an alumni but, of the London School of Economics. I agree, I agree. <laughs> and for, so, the Swiss, for the Swiss, I can say the fact that we have a very strong vocational training system improves the quality of universities because they don't become master universities. Yeah, no, That's the reason agree, of the quality we, of the system university. We do still, at some point, have good institutes of technology, aren't they? Mm. They're rather good in Lausanne and Zurich. So, I, I mean, what happens? Uh, uh, yeah. wh wh where is the gap Finland could get better in? Yeah. Or I wouldn't take Finland only. I, I think yeah, I'd I take, it, take it across the board. And I, I think if you look at the last um, uh, bit of the study that the IMD right, you know, it, it, the question of recruiting talent or, or keeping talent, and Finland was, of course, one of the examples where you say great education system, good place to live, but there's a brain drain out, and then there is not enough people coming in. I, I think we need to do the transition to good universities, and that is a lot about, and I fully, I mean, I take the part of the blame as well. It's about expenditure, how much money you can put into universities. It's about innovation, it's about R&D. You know, Finland's heyday was basically from the early 1990s up until the financial crisis 2008, when we put a lot of money into R&D, a lot of money into education, the boom of Nokia uh, and the rest of it. But I think we have a broader European problem that we have mm -hmm. a brain drain to the US and elsewhere. But, but, but let me just, yeah, one, right. one final point I want to make on this. I, at the same time, do not underestimate the quality of life issue. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we are moving towards a time where Europe will start attracting more and more people. I mean, look at the quality of life here in Switzerland. I mean, you know, it's phenomenal, right? You look at most of uh, Western, Central and Eastern, Northern Europe, it's extremely good in terms of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you get a good, and that, that's what people look for. So I, I think at some stage we're going to see some more talent coming into to, to Europe, and that's at least what I, ho what I hope for. Yeah. Did you want I to add something? I completely agree. I completely agree. One, one last question, if you, if you still have some, raise, raise your hand. If you start. But Mr. Stubb must leave us at five sharp. Yes, madam. Maybe just wait for the mic. It's coming in. And You've got 30 seconds for the question. <laughs> My name is no, Marisa kidding. Bechara. I am Argentinian. I am coach, life coach. A question for Mr. Mauro D'Ambrogio. Uh, it's a little bit related to what uh, Mr. Stav was saying. And my daughter is going to the public system in Switzerland. I, I am very happy with that. But at the same time, I feel, I feel that the structure of the system is very conservative and with a, a fixed mindset, if we talk about Carol Dweck, uh, w between the, the growth and the fixed mindset. My question is, what is the Swiss uh, Ministry of Education doing to adjust uh, the Swiss system to the challenges of the future, where uncertainty is going to be more and more? You move 10 kilometers away in Switzerland and you find another system. Yeah. The, the, that's the reality. It's, it's very, very different. Uh, the system is public. The public means in Switzerland it belongs to the local community or to the cantons. The, 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 the federal state is only the federal institutes in Zurich and, and Lausanne. Even the university belongs to the local. And that means you, you can vote with the feet to say the, a move if you're not happy of, of your school. Private school in Switzerland have a tradition only for foreigners. There were the, 
the children of kings that came to private school in Switzerland, but there is a closed, a closed world for, for, for rich foreigners that has nothing to do with to compete with the with the public system. Uh, people living in Switzerland go to the to the public schools, and the public schools are extremely differentiated. And uh, you, you can find a very, very different system from one canton to the other, sometimes from one local community to the other. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, very interesting explanation. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. And as I mentioned, well, it was the schedule. We had to finish at five sharp. Uh, I give you, um, well, we've got now a short uh, coffee break. And we'll be back at quarter past five for the presentation of the Smart City Index of IMD. See you straight away. Yeah.